truly. Amen. 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 Well, if you have a Bible this morning or a device, let me invite you to take it out and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I just want to remind you as a church where we're headed, and we're going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, But next week, we begin a series in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, And so I hope you'll make plans to be with us as we study that for a few weeks. And then we're going to look at some of the Psalms of Ascent as we prepare our hearts to move into our renovated worship center. Uh, And then we'll together kick off the Gospel of Mark and study it for the next year or so. And so that's where we're headed. But today, uh, we're over halfway through the year. And I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about some of the things God's been doing in our church. I want to kind of give you a a report, a kind of a state of the church address. If you're a guest of ours or a visitor, I want to just make you aware we don't do this very often. We don't talk about uh, necessarily the ways God is blessing us in in, uh, numerical form. and, And we certainly don't want to draw attention to ourselves. Uh, But it's good sometimes for us to kind of think about what is God doing and where are we. And so what I want to do is just kind of give you some some highlights of what's been happening over the year at our church. And then I want to draw your attention to Hebrews chapter 12, how we'll continue to see God move among us by staying focused uh, in his word. I do want to uh, just kind of tell you, first of all, about who we are to make sure we're all kind of being reminded as a church. We say that we have a purpose here uh, and our purpose is to offer hope and build community. That's what we aim for. That's what we desire to do. That's our northern star that we're sailing towards in every area of our church and every ministry. We want to offer the hope of Christ. We want to offer hope to people that are hurting, that are in need of God, that are far from God. We want to offer hope to the believer who's hanging on by a thread. Uh, And in offering hope, we want to build community. We want to build the church, authentic community in Christ uh, in the local church. We want people to feel connected. We want people to feel connected that are in all ages. Uh, So this is what we aim for. This is what we go after. This is what we strive to do. This is what the scripture would tell us, that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, that we are to love Jesus and love the body of Christ. So this is how we say that. This is what we're up to. And to do that, we ask all of our members to follow the plan. We have a plan, uh, and that plan is simply being committed to four areas of the church. One is being committed to worship, gathering together in corporate worship, gathering before the throne of the Lord, singing together, hearing God's word, being committed together as the church has been doing since the resurrection, since that first Easter Sunday morning. We ask our members to be committed to that, to be a part of that. Then we ask everyone to be a part of growing spiritually, both in your private time in God's word and then together in community. For us, primarily, that's in our life group ministry that meets uh, mostly on Sunday mornings where people join together in a life group in a small Bible study of like uh, ages or groups and they study God's word together. Life group is where community happens. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Community groups, life group is the lifeblood of the church. That's how you stay connected. That's how you stay involved. And that's how you get casseroles delivered when you're sick, all right? A life group is where it's at. Or chicken if you're real Baptist, right? Uh, And so we want you to grow with us in Bible study, in small group, grow in our ladies' ministry, grow in our men's ministry. Then we say that every member should serve. Uh, We believe in time, talent, and tithe. You should give your time and your talents to the church in some way and your tithe to the church that every member who is uh, worshiping and growing and serving is a part of that idea of offering hope and building community. And then we say every member should be a part of going, whether that means praying for missions, giving to missions, being a part of missions local to the nations and beyond. Just two weeks ago, we gave a summer missions report of all that God had been doing in our church throughout the summer of our mission efforts. We, as you know, just had a team come back from Asia who was serving there. We have other teams going out later in the fall. Uh, And so we want to be a church that's going. So this is who we are. This is what we do. Uh, This is our plan. And then as a church, we have what we call our priorities. These are our family rules. This is what we operate by. This is every ministry in our church, from the children's ministry to the music ministry to the senior adult ministry to the missions ministry to the life group ministry. We all follow these rules. We try to obey these priorities. We try to live this way. This is our family behavior. Number one, we want to uphold biblical truth. At every turn, our church wants to say, the Bible says and obey it. We do this in our preaching ministry. We do this in the songs that we sing. We do this in our life groups, in our children's ministry. We want to uphold biblical truth. We want to put out in front of the world what the Bible has to say. Not what we have to say, not our opinion, but God's holy word. Number two, we want to show radical hospitality. We believe God's people should be friendly and kind and care for others. Now, I want to be clear about this. We always put number one, number one, and number two, number two, because we will not get rid of biblical authority to show hospitality. 
We will show hospitality while still holding up biblical truth. It is not hospitable to tell the world what the Bible does not say in order to try to be nice. It is hospitable to tell them the truth because they will face the Lord one day in judgment. So we want to make sure we're hospitable and we're kind and we greet people. I hope if you're a guest today, someone has spoken to you, they've been friendly to you, they didn't fuss at you for being in their seat, and if they did, you come report them to me, all right? We want to be hospitable, right? Hospitable. Number three, we want to overwhelmingly love the next generation. We love every generation of the church, but we understand that the world is trying to eat our children alive, and we understand the way in which we reach the gospel to the nations is by reaching the next generation. So we pour a lot of effort into reaching the next generation, and we are unashamed about that. We want children to know the Lord, to love the Lord, to grow up in the Lord, and to pass the faith down that we've received. The once faith passed down, as Jude uh, would tell us. Number four, we strive for excellence in everything we do in every ministry of our church, every activity, every leader, uh, every place, whether you're helping with the three-year-old nursery or you're helping with the 30-year-old life group or you're helping with the much older ministries, right? We want to be excellent. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians, do everything unto the Lord, whether you, uh, how you love your spouse, how you raise your children, how you cut your grass, uh, how you sing, all of it as believers should be worship to the Lord. And so we want to be excellent in what we do. Uh, number five, we labor to spread the gospel. Our purpose is to tell people about Jesus. We worked to do that through the ministries of our church, through the mission efforts, through the money that we give away. We want to tell people about the Lord. We want more people to know Christ because our church existed, because we were a part of sharing the gospel. And then number six, and this one's kind of my personal favorite, we want to talk about Jesus a lot. We want to talk about Jesus at the coffee uh, counter. We want to talk about Jesus in our life group. We want to talk about Jesus in the hallway. We want to talk about Jesus between the stalls and the back. Don't do that. In the restroom, uh, we... We want to talk about Jesus a lot. We want to speak about Jesus. We want to encourage people with Jesus. Today, you're going to hear me talk about Jesus a lot. He is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. He is our only hope. He is the star in which we stare, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We want to be people who tell folks about Jesus. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is our priorities. Now, the question is, is it working? Is God blessing? Well, I want to give you just a few ways in which we've seen God bless as we follow these plans. But I want to make sure I'm very clear. These are not numbers to say, look at us. These are numbers to say, look what God is doing. Look what God is doing. Because I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. Your pastor, though he may look it, is not perfect. And I'm going to let you in on an even bigger secret. You ain't either. But God is good. And he's working through it. So let me just give you some highlights. Here's some cool things that are happening this year. This year alone, this year compared to last year, we're averaging 220 more people in weekly worship than we were last year. The average Baptist church in, in, the, in the United States is less than 125 people. So God's added a whole Baptist church to our congregation this year in worship. That's something to celebrate. Praise the Lord. Thank goodness. Over 300 members. Yeah, amen. At the end of today's service and at the end of next week's service, we're going to introduce to you some new members. And at the introduction of those new members, that means that the Lord in the last two years, really more like 18 months, has added 300 new members to our congregation. Those are folks who have said, I want to be a part of what God is doing at Brushy Creek. Over 300 new members have added. We've had a 22% increase in our life group attendance, that means 22% of our life group attendance last year to this year has gone up. More people are joining in and growing in God's word. More people are joining in to small groups. More people are joining in to being in that community together. More people are tapping into that casserole when you're sick kind of thing, right? Uh, and so we've had 22% more. Our online views of worship have increased from 600 weekly average to 800 weekly average. I think that's a 200 person increase. I'm pretty sure it's just my mama watching the sermons over and over and over. Uh, but we've increased over 200 people watching online more than last year. So the reach of our church is going. We have people who watch our church from Argentina. We have people that watch our church from Indonesia. We have people that watch our church from, uh, they told me the other day, so we have people in Canada that watch our church. Uh, and so, man, praise the Lord for the outreach of the church. I do want to say this, though. This is my pastoral prerogative. Online is a blessing. It is a gift. When you are sick, when you're not able to come, when you're a shut-in, when you're traveling. Last week I was in Asia and I got to watch the service at 2 in the morning. Uh, right? Well, 2 in the morning here. It wasn't 2 in the morning there. I slept. I wasn't coming to church with y'all. Uh, but... I got to watch the service. I got to see what Pastor Benji taught. I got, to, I got to see what God was doing among my church and my people. But let me be very clear with you. The Internet is not the local church, right? 
The body of Christ gathers together. We gather and we worship. Internet is a blessing. It's encouraging. It's a crutch when you have to stay home. But it is not the local church. The TV screen will not give you marriage counseling. The TV screen will not pray with you when you are sick. The TV screen will not hold your hand when you are preparing to go to glory. We do not see online as the church. We see it as an opportunity to reach people with the gospel through technology. But the church gathers together. Now, we've also had over 350 adults and kids participate in our Kids Blast ministry, that overwhelmingly loving the next generation. We have over 250 weekly in our preschool and children's ministry on Sunday morning. And so there's always, some of you said, man, I want a place to serve children, 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 right? That's a place uh, where you can serve. And so we're excited about that. Our student ministry has continued to grow. They're gathering each week. We have more and more students coming. And here's something really cool about our student ministry. Just this past week, we We had students in our student ministry help start an FCA as leadership at a school that had not had an FCA going since COVID. Isn't that awesome? Our students are out serving the Lord, uh, helping that. We also have some students in our student ministry, some of the older girls are teaching a Bible study to the younger girls in the student ministry. They're leading their own peers for the glory of God. Can we give the Lord a hand for that, man? Isn't that amazing? So we're excited about that. Also, over this last year, we've seen some increase in our giving. Uh, We are 20% ahead of budget in giving. Let me see if I can explain that to you, right? They explained it to me so that I could explain it to you, all right? Here's how it works. The church makes a budget, and we live by that budget. We're going to spend this amount of money for this ministry, and this amount of money for this ministry, and this amount of money for this ministry. But that budget only works if the people give the amount of money we expect that they're going to give. So we make a budget based on future giving. And based on future giving, we are already 20% ahead because of your faithfulness to give to the glory of the Lord. Now, wait. That does not mean that because we are 20% ahead, you can take 20% off. But the Lord is blessing it. This year alone, we've had 168 new givers to the church. That means a new family gave, a a new single, a new mom, a new teenager. 168 people gave for the very first time so far this year to the church. We are, uh, $55,000 has been given in extra gifts towards our renovation. We have not asked you for renovation money. We ask you to give faithfully to your tithes and offerings, and we pay for the renovation out of your tithes and offerings. We don't run a campaign at this point in our ministry. We just use the gifts of the disciplined believers who give. But in addition to that, we've had people give above and beyond $55,000 towards the debt. And here's one you don't even know about yet. We have over $50,000 that has already been given to our Go mission offering, the offering we give away in missions to Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong and World Hunger and missions around the world. We've already had $50,000 given to them, and we haven't even kicked the offering off yet. We haven't even advertised it. People are giving to stuff because they know it's coming and they've already started giving. The Lord is blessing us financially. This last one's my favorite though. This year alone, 36 people have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and committed in baptism. And we're going to be baptizing in the weeks to come. We have more already signed up. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I need to be baptized. I need to declare my faith publicly. Then please stop by our connections table on the way out and let them know we want to celebrate that with you as well. We're also in the middle of a renovation. Uh, And so I want to just show you a couple of pictures, some updates on our renovation. This is the current working of our worship center. Uh, Some of the things that you may or may not notice, the wall on the choir space in the back has been flattened out some. And that's so when you're sitting out in the crowd, you'll be able to see better. We changed some of the angles, so you'll be able to see the stage better. Uh, Also, we've captured a little bit more of the stage. This next picture will show you that. Uh, So we've captured a little bit more of the stage uh, so that when I'm in the center preaching, I'm going to be able to spit all the way to the back row. It's going to be... I mean, Holy Spirit driven right there, right? Uh, But a little bit more space because we have so much musical talent and so many folks want to be a father. You can see the dangling tubes from the roof. That means air condition is being installed. Praise be to God uh, for that. Uh, And then you'll also notice the back of the house. We now have a hallway. For those of you that are involved in our music ministry, you'll be able to go back to the rehearsal space without having to walk through the worship center. Uh, You'll be able to double up so we won't have to have you here so early in the morning because you'll be able to rehearse while the services are going on. Uh, This next picture is probably my favorite. You don't know what this is, but I know what this is. This is one of two offices that are being built in the back of the house for our worship pastors, Tom and Robert. And let me tell you why that's amazing. Because when I sit in my office next to Tom and Robert, 
I hear guitars and trumpets, and violins, and banging. And now, by your gracious giving and our renovation, them jokers will be on the other side of the church and I won't have to hear it. Hallelujah. So we have that renovation, that renovation. And then you'll see uh, our, our rehearsal space for our band and choir is going in and being updated, some soundproofing going in so they'll be able to use it. And I want to show you just three more pictures and then we'll look at God's word uh, together. This is uh, over in our children's department, what used to be our old fellowship hall kitchen. It's now being turned into a smaller workroom and break room. And the reason why it's being cut in half is because of the next picture. The next picture is a commode. Did y'all know that? I've been in Asia they don't use commodes. I've never been so excited to see a picture in my life. That is a commode in our children's department. Now, you may ask, well, why does that matter? It matters because up until now, when our children have to use the restroom, we have to leave the secure, locked area and take them out into the hallway. Now they're going to have their own restroom in their own area behind locked doors, which adds one more layer of safety for our children's ministry, which we care so much about. So that may just look like a commode, but it's a big deal in our children's ministry along the way. We're thankful for that opportunity. Then one final picture is our new barn. You may have seen this out in our parking lot. Uh, this is to hold our bus and two new vans that we were able to purchase last year. Uh, new to us, they were used, but they're nice. Uh, new cars that were being purchased, and i got to tell you a funny story. This barn was supposed to be in place about a year ago, but because of some code issues with Greenville County, God bless Greenville County, some code issues, uh, some uh, issues with the manufacturer and the shipping of the steel and the putting it up, it didn't go up until about a month ago. Now, here's what's funny. The Lord's timing. This is what's funny. That building goes up a month ago. As soon as it goes up, we park our three vehicles in that building. The next day, 700 chairs are delivered for the worship center. They're now in the barn, and the vans are back in the parking lot. <laughs> but the Lord knew we needed a storage unit for those chairs that have shipped way too early to our place. So eventually, they will go back into uh, the barn. So we're just excited about what God's doing. He's on the move at Brushy Creek, and it's good to be a part of what God's doing. It's good to be excited. And I want to tell you about one more thing that's happened. I want to introduce you to a new friend of mine, Barry Agnew. Barry Agnew is going to be serving. Come on down, brother. He's going to be serving as our interim student pastor. And I want you to just have a minute to meet him. He's going to introduce his lovely wife, Mandy, and their son, Gideon, and their soon-to-be in the womb child that's coming in January, uh, and he will point them out to you. But Barry is coming to serve as our interim student pastor, and I want you to hear why Barry will not be our student pastor. He is not going to take the job. He cannot take the job, and it's for a good reason. I want you to hear why. If he didn't say it was for a good reason, you'd be worried. What is he talking about? No. Uh, praise the Lord. First off, I want to say I'm so excited to be here today. I'm excited to be a part of what God is doing here, working with these students. Pastor said it earlier, um, but it's a really tough time to be a kid, to be a student, to be a teenager in this country. And it's a very difficult time to follow Jesus faithfully, which is why I'm so excited for the foundation, what God has built here, and what's happening in the lives of these students. Now, with that said, uh, I'm, my background, my career is in student ministry. Been working with students uh, even here in the upstate for over a decade uh, in student ministry. But... Uh, it's a challenge for us. God has called us to something different. God has called our family and uh, my, my wife, Mandy, and my son, Gideon, they're in the back, back there right now. Uh, but he has called us to plant a church. And we're going to be planting a church in southern Greenville County. Uh, I tell people, you're really, if you're really familiar with the big uh, populous areas, uh, you're familiar with the bustling metropolis of Moonville. That's where we'll be planting a lot going on there. Um, no, I, I say that. Years ago, I was on staff at a church down there, uh, all farmland, uh, classically, historically, it's uh, dairy farms, or as they say, dairy farms. Um, but the reality is, if you've driven down that area, much like the rest of Greenville, it's absolutely exploded in growth. The population has almost tripled within 10 years. And what we're seeing is people from all over our country, just like the rest of Greenville, just like here in Taylor's, people from the Northeast, the West Coast, the Midwest, all around they're moving here, and they're moving down there uh, in mass. Many are lost and broken in their sin. 
And so God has given us this charge uh, to go plant in Southern Greenville County. And so that's why, as hard as it is for me, that's why I will not be the student pastor in the long run, but he's blessed me uh, with the opportunity to be here as the interim and to, <clears throat> to work with students. I'm so excited. If, I've met many of you. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love for you to come talk to us and, and say hi. And I want to thank you for, uh, for, for what you are doing for the kingdom here at Brushy Creek. And we are so excited to join in and be a part of what God is already doing. Amen. Y'all help me welcome Barry. You can take it. Just take it. <clears throat> so Barry is working with our Greenville Baptist Association, our South Carolina Baptist uh, Cooperative Program, our NAM. He's working through all of those to be a church planner. And so we get to, as a church, uh, get some labor out of him as an interim youth minister, but also get to join him in this journey of praying and helping him launch out in the next uh, year uh, to go and plant that church in uh, South Greenville County. And the Lord just orchestrated that at the right timing. And so we're thankful for that, and we're thankful for what God is doing among our church. Now, all of this is to say, how do we not trip? How do we not fall? How do we not lose focus? We can celebrate all the things God's doing and we can feel puffed up and, and feel uh, excited, uh, but we understand that around every corner are snares, and trials, opportunities for division, opportunities for struggle. So how do we continue to keep the momentum of what God is doing? Well, if you have your Bible, look there at Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to show you how a church lives, works, worships, serves for the glory of the King. That the focus of the church should not be our programs and our ministries and our numbers and our tithes and offerings, but the focus of our church must always be King Jesus. And when King Jesus is the focus of the church, all the other things are added unto it. All the other blessings come along with it. I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. I've read the books. I've watched the movies a hundred times. And, and I always enjoy the, the, the contrast of good versus evil, light versus dark. And somewhere in those movies, there is this epic speech where they're getting ready to go to battle. And they're outnumbered and they're worn down. And the, the, the speech is to draw courage into the, the, the soldiers. And at some point, the speeches go somewhere. Something like this for the glory of the king. And the idea is, is that in the, in the movie or in the show that, that there is this idea that you want to draw people's eyes to something larger than what's around them. You want to see something bigger than what's happening. So for us as a church to stay faithful and to see God continue to bless, we have to keep our eyes above what's around us and continue to look at the glory of the king. Look with me at Hebrews Chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, quickly this morning, I want to show you how we as a church can stay focused on the glory of the King. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. Consider him who endured for sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, for just a moment, Lord, would you help us to see how we as a church can celebrate, certainly, can clap and rejoice in the, in the positive things we've seen and heard that you're doing among our church. It's good to be a part of a church that's full of life and joy and momentum and seeing lives change. It's good to be a part of that. But Lord, we want to be with fear and trembling and cautious. We, we want to say, Lord, we know it's not us. It's not us, it's you. And so for a few moments, Father, would you help us as individuals see how together as the church we remember that, that our service, our life, our activities, our, our very gathering is for your glory, not ours. It's not ours, Father. Our hands will save no one. It's you, Lord, who deserve it. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me quickly give you three truths this morning that I think will help us as a church live for the glory of the King, that we will keep the priority of Jesus the center of our lives. Truth number one, a church that lives for the glory of the King makes Jesus its focus. 
makes Jesus its focus. If you'll recall with me, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, he's been writing about the saints of the faith that have gone before, and he's been talking about how these saints are examples to us. They're a cloud of witnesses for us. He thinks of Abraham. He thinks of Noah. He thinks of David. He tells us how they have set before us a great example, and we as a church can look behind us in our over 240 years of history and see a great example of people who have come before us, and so we understand that it's our turn to take up the mantle and run the race, and so what he will say is here's how you run the race here's how you focus on what's important here's how you make sure to keep the main thing the main thing here's how you understand not to get lost in the accolades of what you think is important but to stay focused on the Lord and so he will tell us that the church that is after the glory of the king is one that focuses on Jesus look there at verse 2 notice what the writer of Hebrews says he says, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. You see that word, looking. In the Greek, it means not to just glance. It means not to just give a pass-by look. In the Greek, the word means to behold. It means to stare at. It literally means to stop focusing on everything else and focus solely on what's in front of you. So the writer of Hebrews says, here's what the church is to do. Here's what the follower of Christ is to do. Throw off your sin, throw off your past, throw off all that entangles you. Stop staring at anything else but Christ. Focus on Christ. Let Christ be the center of your gaze, the behold of your heart. The moment that you wake to the moment that you sleep, let Christ consume your thoughts. Let Christ be what you focus on in every area of your life. This is soul work. This is discipline. This is to rise and say, Jesus will be the center of my view today. I will look nowhere else. I will stare for no other glory. I will seek only Christ. I will look to him and him alone. A church that stops looking to Christ is a church that no longer deserves to be a church. We must look to Christ. We do not look to the numbers of our budget. We do not look to the numbers of our baptistry. We do not look to the numbers of the square footage of our building. We look to Christ. Let Christ be the center. Let Christ be what we stare at in the midst of storms. Let Christ be what we look at when the church goes through trial and struggle and pain and sorrow. Let Christ be what we stare at when the church is on the mountaintop rejoicing in the goodness of God. Let Christ be be our focus. Before I was a pastor, I was working on my undergrad and my master's degree, and my wife and I lived and worked at a camp in Alabama. Shaco Springs is the Baptist Camp and Conference Center of Alabama. I was the recreation director of the camp. I got paid to play. You are looking at a professional athlete. I don't appreciate that laughter. One of my jobs as the recreation director was maintain the ropes course. We had a ropes course, a challenge course. A ropes course is where people come and they experience team building by fear. We had 60-foot telephone poles and trees, and we ran cables from tree to tree and pole to pole, and people would put on harnesses and clip in, and they would pay us money to climb up there and get scared. And it never failed. That someone would clip into the harness and clip into the rope and they would scurry up the steps and they would get up on the giant platform on the tree and they would feel like they were brave and could conquer the world and they would step on the cable and they would hold the wires and it would begin to shake but they were brave and then they would take one step and two steps and three steps and then they would look down and gravity was calling. The cable was shaking. The trees were moving. And to their credit, on the other end of the rope was a 22-year-old shaved head with a goatee holding a rope, and they put their life in my hands. Now, I wouldn't have done that either. But it never failed that the way in which to get them across their fear was to say to them, don't look down, don't look back, don't look around, Look at the tree in front of you. And slowly but surely, their steps would begin to follow their eyes and they would make it from place to place to place. Why? 
Because their gaze began to focus on what was in front of them. Brothers and sisters, it does not uh, go far in this world until we begin to shake. There will be trials that come into our church and we will feel shaky. We will look around and see the waves and the storms and the trials and the struggles. We will look around and see death and sorrow and sickness. And we certainly can find ourselves on the wire in the middle of the air shaking. But the answer to a church that weathers the storm is focusing in front on Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, if you want to live for the king, focus on Jesus. Notice what he says there. Focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He says, here's why you focus on Jesus. Because he is first the author of your faith. He is the founder of your faith. He is the writer of your faith. You have no faith if it were not for Jesus. Without his death, burial, and resurrection, there is no trail to follow. There is no path to find. There is no way to the king. Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other name given among me in which you can be saved but Jesus. So what do we find? We stare at Jesus because we have no other path leader. We have no other way to turn. We look nowhere else to salvation. We stare at Jesus because he is our salvation. But notice what he says the author and perfecter of our faith. We stare at Jesus not just because he is our Savior. We stare at Jesus because he has set an example for us. He is the author and perfecter. He's working in us. We stare at Jesus not only because he is our Savior and he has set an example, but we stare at Jesus because he is our strength. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's working in us to do something we cannot do in ourselves. The writer of Hebrews says, stare at Jesus and your faith will be made in salvation. It will be set as an example in Christ and it will be strengthened along the way. church that lives for the glory of the king sets their focus on Jesus. I got eight minutes to cover two more points. Number two. Y'all should know by now I don't really pay attention to the clock. Number two, a church that lives for the glory of the king makes Jesus his example. Look at verse two again. Look what he says. He says in verse two, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. I want you to mark two words there in your Bible, joy and cross. Brothers and sisters, those two words do not go together. They do not match in our vocabulary. There is nothing joyful about the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ was a place of death and torture and shame and sorrow. It's a place where the sins of the world were laid on his shoulders and nails were driven through his hands and thorns on his brow. His body contorted and twisted, suffocation set in on his lungs, and the wrath of God was poured out. There was not joyful that day on that good Friday when the sky turned black and death came for our Savior. There was no joy in the cross. So what is the writer of Hebrews saying? Here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. This means that Jesus saw past the cross. He saw past the cross to the children of God who were saved in his blood and will be gathered unto the kingdom. He saw past the cross to a father in heaven who will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He saw past the cross to the the place where he would rise and be given the name of salvation seated at the right hand of the Father. What Jesus did is he endured the suffering because he saw the glory on the other side. And in doing so, he sets for us an example. How do I mean? It means this. We endure in this life because we know that it's worth it in the next. We are a church that stays faithful to the Bible when the world does not because we know the joy on the other side is worth it. We suffer together, and we weep together, and we mourn together. Why? Because brothers and sisters, joy comes in the morning. The writer of Hebrews says, if you want to live your life for the glory of the king, focus on Jesus and follow his example. And what was his example? The cross, then the resurrection. You see, many of us, we want the resurrection, we forget we're supposed to bear the cross. We want the joy and skip the tears. We want the garden of resurrection, but we forget the garden of Gethsemane. We are to follow Jesus. So I confess to you, 
I've not been around as long as some of you, but I've been around long enough to know that the church will face trials. That we will face struggles. There will be ups and downs and hard days and good days. But here's how we know we will get through it. We will focus on Jesus. We will follow his example. And we will be sure that whatever suffering we go through, it's because joy is on the other side. Let me give you a third truth from the text. A church that lives for the glory of the king makes Jesus its hope. Look at verse 2 again. We close here. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer of Hebrews is very versed with Levitical law. The writer of Hebrews understood that in the Old Testament, the priest would sacrifice and sacrifice again and again and again. And year after year, week after week, century after century, blood of cows and bulls and sheep and lambs and doves and pigeons had to be spilt for the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin, the obedience to God. But the writer of Hebrews knows that all of that was just setting the table for what the Bible would say in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus Christ went to the cross and was crucified and buried as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God. And now he has been resurrected from the the dead. He has ascended to the Father and he is seated at the right hand of God and he's sitting there because there is no more sacrifice needed. There is no more need for bulls and calves and high priests in holies of holies. We have the high priest. He is sitting at the Father and his sacrifice is enough. And so what the writer of Hebrews tells us is We live for the glory of the king because we focus on Jesus, our Savior, and we follow his example. But we live for the glory of the king because there is coming a day where he will enter us into the kingdom forever because he has finished it. In fact, Paul would say this in Ephesians. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice, notice this past tense. We were saved in Christ, and when we're saved in Christ, we are seated with Christ in heaven, which means we are already there. I know. Tomorrow morning, when you make your way through Greenville traffic, and you're sitting in your car, it does not feel like you are sitting in the throne room of God with Jesus. Some of you might use Jesus' name, but it ain't appropriate. What the writer of Hebrews is telling us and what Paul is saying is that when you come to Christ, it is finished. It is done. It is secured. Your seat is in glory. Your table is reserved. Your mansion is built. Your sacrifice has been paid. You have the hope of glory. So no matter what we face, no matter what tomorrow may bring, no matter what trial the church may go through, we live for the glory of the king because the king already has our reservation. We trust in Jesus. We make much of Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. I love the way T.E. Marsh writes about Jesus. Listen to his words. In Christ there is full acceptance, therefore do not doubt him. In Christ there is peace, therefore trust him. In Christ there is life, therefore abide in him. In Christ there is blessing, therefore delight in him. In Christ there is light, therefore follow him. In Christ there is power, therefore wait on him. In Christ there is all truth, therefore learn from him. In Christ there is grace, therefore receive from him. In Christ there is joy, therefore rejoice in him. In Christ there is unlimited wealth, therefore depend on him. In Christ there is strength. Therefore, lean on him. Look at verse 3. Consider him who endured for sinners such hostility. Consider what he did for us. Consider his death, burial, and resurrection, his suffering for sin. Consider the shame that was placed on him. Consider the nails in his hands. Consider what he did for you and for me. And now notice what he says. So that you may not grow weary or faint heart. Oh, friends, I have full expectation that next September I'll stand up in front of you and say, we've added more in baptism. We've added more in budget. We've added more in life group attendance, in service. 
I have full encouragement that God's going to continue to bless us. But here's what I know for sure. He will not bless us because we have good programs, big buildings, lots of money, or the best-looking preacher in town. Okay. He will bless us when we live for the glory of the king. When we focus on Jesus, and we follow his example, and we place all our hope in him, that's, that's the sweet spot. That's how we can endure in the hard days. That's how we can celebrate in the good days. That's how we can hold out with hope. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I want to say thank you for joining us online this morning for worship. It's always a joy that technology allows us to stream to you God's Word, and you can watch us worship together. But I want to especially invite you to come join us. As summer comes to an end and we begin the fall season, it's a great time to plug in. We'll see lots of new faces come in because of the school year beginning and families coming back from vacation. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to come join us in person. Find the place where you plug in. Let us minister together as we grow in Christ. If you want more information about our church or how you can plug in, go to brushycreek.org and you'll find all kind of answers there. Or you can call our church office anytime during the week. We'd love to answer your questions and see you in person on our campus. Hope you have a great week and God bless you.